Well, good morning, Rocky Peak. Great to see you. So good to be with you. Uh, if we haven't met yet, my name is Michael, and I'm one of the pastors. And uh, so whether it's your first time or you're a regular, and then maybe you're joining us online for the first time, special welcome. Uh, we're going to go into our time of teaching in just a minute, but I just have a couple quick things uh, I want to share with you as well. First of all, you probably noticed this big screen uh, behind us. And uh, it's funny, it's, it's kind of new to you, but it's actually been around for a while. Uh, some of you will remember back in that thing we called COVID. Remember that thing back then? And uh, some of you were here then that we did outside services. And one of the decisions we had to make was, hey, do we want to invest in a, like a huge screen you know, for those services? And obviously they're expensive. And so one of the questions I asked our staff is like, well, if we get that, uh, can we repurpose it later in our worship center? You know? And so they said, yes, we can. And so that's been the plan all along. But the parts that we needed to connect it up here were on a slow boat from China. <laughs> <laughs> they were caught up in the supply chain issue. And so we just got them and installed it this week. So we're excited about that. Uh, uh, secondly, uh, this week, next week, the next week, uh, we're going to be talking about some uh, very controversial uh, kind of uh, topics about human sexuality. And I'm really looking forward to that. But I just wanted to make you aware, if your parents, you have younger children, if you have students, this would be awesome for them to be here. But if you have younger children, I want to give you a heads up so that during our time of prayer, if you feel like that's not quite appropriate, this will be kind of PG, you know, PG plus, something like that, uh, rated. And uh, so if, the, if, if you want to make the great escape, this is your great opportunity. And uh, we've got our kids ministry out there, and you watch outside, and you, hey, look, honey, there's a bird. And, uh, you know, <laughs> so let's, uh, let's pray together, all right? Well, Father, we're just excited to be here in your house and on your day to come under your leadership. And we just thank you so much for Jesus, the gift of your son who, who comes to rescue, restore, to redeem, and as we see today, to recreate all of this fallen creation, including our lives. And so we pray that today that you would come by the power of your spirit, you'd be the loudest voice in this room, that we would each hear you according to what you're saying to us, that we would go out a little bit uh, better understanding what it looks like to listen, to follow, and to be renewed in our lives into the image of our creator. We pray this in Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. amen. Well, our story today starts back in May, and we have some friends, uh, the friends here at Rocky Peak, and several years ago, they, they purchased a, uh, an upstairs loft in kind of a downtown section uh, of, a, of a kind of a small town in Virginia. Uh, their, their son was going to school there, and so they wanted a place to go. Eventually, he would live there, sometimes off campus, but, but for the last couple of years, they've been telling us, uh, hey, uh, we would love for you to go sometime, maybe when our son's not there, and just uh, kind of enjoy the place. Great time for R&R. &R. It's a fun town to explore. It's a historic area, a lot of things in the area. And so uh, finally this last, last May, Lynn and I took him up on that. And so uh, we had a great time, uh, just some good R&R &R time, good reconnection time. Uh, I loved exploring the exploring city, going on hikes and so on. Uh, we went down to see Jefferson's Monticello. That was really fun. Um, but in the evenings, you know, we had a free schedule, which never happens for us. You know, it's just a kind of open schedule. And so each night we would turn on their large screen TV and kind of catch up maybe on a show or see a movie that we hadn't seen before. And so um, one of those shows that uh, we, we caught up on and that we, we'd heard a lot about, very popular, highly recommended, uh, was the show Ted Lasso. Huh? <laughs> Well, today, our, uh, <laughs> we're, we're continuing a series that we've been in uh, that's called The Gospel of God. And for those who are new, and I'm just so aware that every week uh, we have new people coming to Rocky Peak, new people joining us online. So I always like to just take a second, kind of bring us up to speed. So th this series uh, is really an in-depth study of one of the most important letters ever written in the history of the human race. No, no exaggeration, one of the most influential and it's, it's, it's contained in the second part of our Bibles that we call the New Testament. Uh, it was written by one of the great leaders of the early church. His name was Paul or the Apostle Paul. And he's writing to a group of Christ followers he's actually never met. Uh, he's planning to go and visit them. They live in the capital city of the Roman Empire in the city of Rome itself, about a million people at this time. 
And in this, uh, in this, in the, in this, um, this letter, uh, the topic which he introduces in the very first statement in verse one is what he calls the gospel of God, kind of the big picture story of our race and God's re- uh, kind of uh, rescue mission to our race through the Messiah. And so we, we, this, uh, this letter is called the Letter of the Romans. This series is called the Gospel of God. And so uh, if you've been with us in this series, um, we've, uh, we've kind of been, uh, a few weeks ago, we entered into the very kind of first main section of the main body of the letter that starts in the middle of chapter one, goes through the middle of chapter 15. And in this opening section, the opening chapters, what Paul is sharing is a big picture story of our race, how as a race we have rebelled against our creator, uh, we've turned against the, the truth that, uh, of God that's revealed in creation, revealed in our conscience, and as a result, the lights have gone out on us as a race, uh, intellectually, morally, uh, psychologically, relationally, and so on. Uh, and as a result, our, it's plunged our whole race into this downward death spiral that starts with spiritual confusion that leads to sexual confusion and finally ends in social chaos. And so today, for the first time, we're launching into this second stage of the downward spiral, which is sexual confusion. Now, we're actually going to spend three weeks on this. Uh, we're going to be looking this week at kind of the big picture, God's vision for human sexuality uh, and, 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 and kind of what it looks like to live a life of sexual integrity in general. Next week, we're going to be talking about the next topic that Paul brings up, the next level of kind of sexual confusion, which is same-sex relationships. And then the third week, we're going to come, come back and talk about transgender ideology. So that's kind of big, big three weeks. And so uh, I hope we have a congregation left by the time we end this. But uh, anyway, uh, me and Jesus will be here, all right? So uh, anyway, so uh, if you have your Bibles, let's open up and uh, jump in. Just to set the stage, uh, we're going to start at verse 18. And... Uh, and then we're going we're to go today through verse 25. So uh, Paul starts off, remember this is the opening statement of the letter, the opening statement of the body of the letter. After his intro, he says, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. And so two things to notice here. First of all, we've talked quite a bit about the wrath of God. Joel did a great job on this last week that that the wrath of God is like the flip side of the goodness or the love of God. That if you truly love what is good and right and true, then you're going to hate what is wrong, what is evil, what is destructive. And, and so we see that throughout the Bible. We'll talk about that more today. And so it says the wrath of God is being revealed. And the reason it's being revealed is because that as a race, we have suppressed the truth. The truth about who God is, the truth about who we are, and the truth about the path to life. And so as a result of this, the lights are going to go out, right? When we reject the truth, this is what we call the dimmer switch principle, the lights go out. And so this is what Paul says. Next, let's go to verse 21. He says, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God. We don't let God be God, nor give thanks to him, but their thinking became what? Futile. Remember in the Greek, kind of empty, void. And their foolish hearts were what? So this is what we call the dimmer switch, whether it's in our own life or as a race or a culture. When we reject the truth, we reject the light, we turn away, the lights go out, and it starts us on this downward spiral. And so he says, although they claim to be wise, verse 22, they became what? Fools. Fools. And we're seeing that in our culture right now, right? We're seeing this, this played out right time, real time in our culture. Remember, this word for fools is the word moreno. So it's where we get our word morons. But it didn't mean morons at the time. It just meant foolish, but that's where we get our work. So, so he says, uh, and, he says and, and so the first stage of this downward spiral is spiritual confusion. When we reject the truth about who God is, because we're wired to worship, that's who we are, we're always going to find something to worship. 
Uh, it can be uh, an idol. It can be an ideology. It can be something in creation that we make as our top. Well, we're always going to find something that this is our top value in life. And so he says, historically, in the human race, you see this worked out in every culture in idolatry. So he says, they, uh, they exchanged the glory of the immortal God, this amazing God, for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. So this is stage one, uh, spiritual confusion about who God is. But here's the thing, you and I were created in the image of God. So when we have the wrong image of who God is, we get the wrong image of who we are. We lose ourselves in the process. And so he says, one of the areas this works out and you see it in human nature is in our approach to sexuality. Why sexuality? Because it's one of our strongest drives, right? And so when we lose touch with God, this gets worked out in our sexuality. And so he says, um, that therefore, in verse uh, 24, therefore God gave them over. So remember, in verse 18, he says, the wrath of God is being revealed. And then three times in this passage, he tells us how it's being revealed. And how it's being revealed is God says, if you want to reject the truth, I'll let you go. You have free will, but you're heading down a path to destruction. You can choose to believe a lie, but you're going to pay the price for it. And he says, so here it comes. So God gave them over to the sinful desires of their hearts, of our fallen humanity, to sexual immorality for the what? The, the, the degrading of our bodies. So in the Greek, uh, this word can be translated dis- degrading. It can also be uh, translated um, dishonoring. It can also be translated um, of, uh, to kind of to remove the value, to, to uh, take away the value. And so, uh, so he says that, that this, re, uh, re, uh, this result of rejecting the truth uh, leads to sexual immorality, which is actually just a degrading, a dishonoring um, of our very selves. As long as we, we lose our humanity in the process. We become less like the creator, the people we were created to be. And he says, uh, he comes back then to this core sin of the human race, this rejection of truth. He says, they exchange the truth of God for a what? And that, that's the bottom. Of the, that's where it starts. When we reject the truth, we start down this downward cycle. So here's what I want to do today. And the time that we have to do today, I want to compare and contrast kind of the biblical big picture view of human sexuality, the worldview of the Bible, with the worldview of human cultures, all right? And so back, you remember back in January, we did this series on worldview, and I had many agendas for that, but one of them was to to introduce this concept of worldview, that what we see, we live in a culture that's changing very rapidly, and we often see these different changes whether it's in economics and sexuality and government and politics and social relationships and race relations, we often see them as if they're unrelated. But the reality is they're flowing out of a different worldview. And so as followers of Jesus, I want us to learn how to see every issue that we face in, through, the, through the lens of worldview. And so what we want to do the next three weeks is say, hey, what is the worldview of the Bible of Jesus, of the apostles, when it comes to human sexuality? What's the worldview of our culture so we can understand why the differences are so great and why we're living in a culture that's in a collision course, all right? So what I want to do today is just lay the groundwork as we go through and we talk about, hey, what is God's vision for uh, sexuality? What's our culture's vision for sexuality? And what does it mean for us as followers of Jesus? Can we start today with three basic principles? We're going to use this passage in Romans as sort of a jumping off point, a window into the worldview of the Bible. Uh, we're going to be looking at what Jesus says. We're going to be looking at what Genesis says, creation. We're going to be looking at, at what uh, the apostles says and so on. Uh, and then we're going to be comparing and contrasting with the worldview of our culture. So there in your note sheet, the gospel of God, sex 101, the Christian worldview. So the first thing when we come to the Bible, this is where we need to start. And the big picture story of the Bible is that, and the role sex plays in it, is that sex is a God thing. Okay? Sex is that God created it. It's not just a good thing. It's a God thing. It's something he created. So let's stand back and let's talk about the biblical worldview and, and the role sexuality plays in it. So what were we, when we open the first page of the Bible, in Genesis chapter 1, 
we're introduced to this God who is um, incredibly brilliant, uh, powerful, creative, uh, a God who loves beauty and order, and is completely good. And out of that goodness, he creates this amazing cosmos that we're still just beginning to scratch the surface to understand whether it's at a, the nano level or the macro level. And so at every stage of the creation process in Genesis chapter 1, God says this creation is good, completely good. In fact, when he ends it, he says at the end, it is very good. And the high point of the creation is the creation of this first man, this first woman, and catch these, these three statements I'm going to make. Number one, to be like God, created in his image. Number two, to be in relationship with God. And number three, to rule over the creation for God. And when we get into, and so, so the creation of this first man, the first woman, is part of this very good statement that God makes. It's the high point, right? And so when we get into chapter 2, uh, the author Moses begins to delve in, kind of zoom in on the creation of the first man and the first woman. Tells us, gives us more information. And what we learn, and I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but God creates the first man and the first woman differently. That he starts from scratch with the man. Right? That he start, we're told from the dust of the earth, he creates the man, right? And then after he figures out what he did wrong, no, no, just kidding. Just kidding. Okay. Uh, that's just one for the women. Okay, we'll equal up later on. Right. But then catch this, after he creates, I don't know if you've ever thought about it, he doesn't say, okay, now let's create another, another human. It'll start with the dirt. He says, no, out of the one, will come the other. So catch this, from the one will come two. And we're told that from, we often translate it rib, in the, in the Hebrew, it's a word that can be translated rib, side, from the side, like from the DNA, from the side of the man, he creates the woman. So from the one comes two. And then God introduces the woman to the man and God officiates at the first wedding ceremony. And after that ceremony is done, this is what Mo Moses says. He says, there in your note sheet, Genesis chapter 2, he says, gives an explanation. After he explains how from the one came two, he says, that is why. Since the, from the one came the two, that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. You see that? From the one comes the two, and it's been his design all along that then the two become one. Now, this is very significant. Could just a quick sidebar here. This has nothing to do with what we're talking about today. But just a quick sidebar. I can't tell you how many marriages are destroyed because either the husband or wife doesn't understand that their primary loyalty is to their spouse, not to their parents. That when a couple gets married, you leave. You leave your mother and father, you form a new family, and your new primary loyalty is now to your spouse. And when we get that messed up, it causes lots of problems, doesn't it? Some of you are going like, just very, very gently, but I saw you, I saw you. Uh, it was a woman. Uh, uh, yeah. Hey, we're even, we're even now, we're even, all right? Yeah. I, this is like too touchy a subject, I don't want to get on anyone's bad side. All right, um, all right so, so I want you to notice a couple of things from what Moses says here about marriage. The first thing, I want you to notice that God's vision is one flesh. Right? So, so one flesh means a lot of things. It probably means more than sexual union, but it doesn't mean less. That God's designed our bodies to come together in marriage, in human sexuality. Right? And so, so that's part of the very good. 
all the pleasure, all the fun, all the excitement. That's part of God's very good creation. Secondly, notice what he says next, that Adam and Eve were both, let's say it in church, naked, naked, right? They were naked (laughs) and they felt no shame. Now, how cool is that, right? You're in this perfect world, in this perfect garden, you're both naked, you're in the presence of God and God says, okay, let's go, right? (laughs) Now, what I want you to catch is that God's vision has always been uh, the beauty of this very special relationship. Here's the thing. What we see in the Bible is sex is, is very clearly designed for one man and for one woman to enter into this relationship, help seal and cement and reestablish time and time again this oneness of body, soul, and spirit. And it's that it's uh, in that context, it's this incredible gift. Um, And within that context is where we bring children into the world, into a home with a mother and a father, who love one another and love them and create this beautiful environment of safety where they can be instructed about the creator and grow up and thrive. That's God's vision, all right? And so, uh, so this is God's vision from the very start. Now, once you see this in the opening pages of the Bible, you see it all the way through. And we don't have time today to go into great detail, but I just want to give you a few examples of this. Um, when you jump ahead to the book of Proverbs, You have, for example, this father talking to his son about one day the relationship, the sexual relationship he has with his wife. And he says, may your uh, fountain be blessed and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. A loving doe, a graceful deer, may her breasts satisfy you always and may you ever be intoxicated with her love. That's God's word to us, right? Sex is not just a good thing, it's a God thing in that context of this covenant relationship of marriage. If you've ever read the the book Song of Solomon, the entire book is about this romantic love, sexual relationship between this this young bridegroom and his bride, and it's very explicit. We just don't have time, I wish we had time to go through it today, but I had to cut something out, so I put it there, and it's uh, the the more explicit, uh, like an example of that would be in chapter seven, all right? So if you want to read that. Uh, not now, I just lost half of you. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, when, you, when you jump in the New Testament, it's interesting. When Paul's writing to the church at Corinth, we saw this in our last series last year in the Corinthians, that when Paul's writing to that church, there are some in the church coming from their Greek philosophy background that think, hey, now that we've come to Jesus, we shouldn't have sex in our marriages. It's actually more spiritual uh, not to. And Paul says, no, no, no. If you're a follower of Jesus, uh, your sexuality in marriage is actually like a spiritual duty. It's like a spiritual discipline. And he says the husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. Do not deprive each other, right? This is an important part. And then in Hebrews 13, a verse uh, kind of in the very last miscellaneous section of this final chapter of Hebrews, this is what he says. He says marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept what? So what he's saying is the marriage bed is pure. It's holy, um, but, but it's, it, we need to keep it pure by not letting anything interfere with that. And so he goes on and he says, but God will what? Judge the, the home and the... Okay, can you underline that line? Because often we think, uh, hey, we're Christians, uh, God won't judge us. And it's like, he's writing to Christians, right? And so I want you to remember that line as we'll, we'll come back to it later. So, so this is what we see throughout the Bible. In fact, in the Old Testament, God uses the, 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 uh, the metaphor of marriage and the sexual relationship in marriage to describe his love relationship with Israel. And the New Testament, God uses uh, the marriage relationship to describe the relationship between the Messiah, the bridegroom, and his people, the bride. Okay, so let's where we start, that, that, uh, that uh, sex is a God thing. Number two, uh, but as opposed to that, because sex is such a powerful connector, uh, because it's, it's, it's designed to do something really well in marriage, but outside of it, it doesn't, uh, we go like this, sex outside of marriage is destructive, So this is clear all the way through the Bible. Now, just for sake of definition today, I don't want there to be any any lack of clarity. When we talk today, when the Bible talks about sexual immorality, by definition, it's talking about any sex outside of this one man, one woman, lifetime commitment 
of uh, marriage, right? So, so that would take in premarital sex, right? Whether that's uh, a hookup on Tinder for a one-night set, or whether it's a long-term relationship where you sometimes plan to get married. It takes in living together before we're married. It takes in living together, oh, but we're engaged. Uh, it takes in uh, extramarital relationships, right? It takes in, and I know you might say that, hey, you don't need to say this here, but I know I do from experience. It takes in threesomes. It takes in wife swapping, right? It takes in sex outside, uh, 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 same-sex relationship. It takes in sex with children, right? Which is on the rise in our culture. I don't know if you know that, but this will be the next frontier after transgenderism. It's already starting. It's, it's already been re-termed, right? Is a uh, preference for minors, right, right, right? It's already happening. It will happen because it's always happened in human culture. You know, when Paul wrote this, it's crazy. Sometimes we'll say, hey, you know, well, the Bible was written a long time ago. Times have changed. And yes, they have. They've actually gotten better. That if you were to study this in the first century, Sexual immorality is defined with was much more widespread, uh, and the types of sexuality were much more widespread than today. So, so in the Bible, any sex outside of that marriage, and you're thinking, oh no, I thought I was the exception. No, you're not, <laughs> right? That if, it's, if you're not married and you're having sex, by definition, that's sexual immorality, all right? So what the Bible says is this is actually destructive. Because this relationship is so powerful in the way it unites, that it's actually destructive when it's used in a relationship that's not a permanent one forever. So uh, if we had more time today, we would talk more about this. Uh, if you're interested in this, uh, I did a series before I even came to Rocky Peak called Sex and the Single Life. And it's a five-message series. It's on our website. One of the messages is called The High Cost of uh, sexual immorality, and I talk about 10 of the high costs, right? So there's a lot of them. We still have time for it. If you say, well, I, I want some more recent. Uh, last year, we did a series on 1 Corinthians. It was called uh, Christ, Culture, and the Cross, and I did a message called Sex in the City, and if you go on that, 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 that will talk more about like why it's so destructive, all right? But for today, I just want to focus on one statement that Paul makes in this passage, and it's in chapter 1 and verse 24. It's there on your note sheet. It says, therefore, God gave them over and the sinful desires to sexual impurity for the what? Degrading. The degrading of their bodies with one another. So first of all, don't miss that. God gave them over. That sexual immorality, when we're participating by definition, we're experiencing the wrath of God in our life. There, he has designed creation in a certain way, and when we rebel against that, God says, I will let you go, but you will pay the price because it's not designed to work that way. So this word degrading, I talked about a little bit before, but again, in the Greek, it could be translated degrading, it could be translated dishonor, it could be translated to bring shame. And I think we understand this, like when we degrade something or dishonor something. When you take something of high value and you drag it through the mud, you dishonor that thing and you reduce its value. You, 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 it's a shameful thing. Like when you take something valuable and you use it in a way it's not designed that reduces its value. And so this is what Paul is saying, that when we engage in sex outside the body, it is actually degrading to our bodies, and it's another way of saying that we're losing our humanity in the process. There's a leanness of soul that takes place. Now, I want you to catch this. That, that's, the, that's, that's the biblical worldview, okay? I want you to catch how, that, how great that's at odds with our current culture's worldview. Right? So I want to make two statements about our current culture's worldview. Like if I had to say, hey, what is the worldview of most people in our current culture? Here's, I think, the worldview when it comes to sexuality. I'd say this, all sex is good sex. 
as long as it's with consenting adults. That's the basic rule of thumb. And secondly, catch this, that your sexual desires is the key to your identity as a person. Like, who are you? You're a person that's defined by your sexual desires. And that the path to fulfillment in human flourishing is by engaging and pursuing those desires. If you don't pursue those desires, you're denying your humanity, you're losing your life, you'll never live a full life. So that, that's kind of our current culture. I was struck by this uh, recently. Remember when Lynn and I went back to uh, Virginia in May, we stayed at this friend's loft, just such a beautiful gift they gave us, had a great time there. And like I said, in the evenings, uh, we had you know, this kind of free schedule, and it's like, let's well, catch up some movies, whatever. And so one of those we'd been recommended you know, several times by people was Ted Lasso. And we, we don't have Apple TV, and they did, and so, so we began to watch this. Well, I don't know if you've ever seen that show, um, but if you've never seen it, just let me hear the, the basic plot line, is there's this American coach, right? He's probably a middle-aged guy, I don't know, 35, 38, 42, I don't know, um, little dumpy. Um, and he, um, but he, he's... <laughs> But uh, he's, he's, uh, he's hired to coach a professional soccer team in England. Now, he doesn't know anything about soccer, right? And I won't go into the reason why he's hired for that, but he doesn't really know. And so the, the premise is already humorous, right? He already kind of set up for humor. And, and this guy, Ted, Ted Lasso, he's a very winsome guy. He's very likable. He's super positive. He's kind, right? So you're kind of drawn to him. And early on in the show, we find out that he's actually married, that he has a wife and a son that he loves very much uh, back in America. And he's like Skyping with them and so on, you know, what, doing face, face, uh, FaceTime and so on. And uh, with his son. But early in the show, uh, his wife decides to divorce him, partly because he's so positive and it's so irritating. Right? So I know that several of you have husbands like that, but uh, it's, a, it's a very common thing we deal with all the time. My husband's just too nice, he's too positive, he's too kind. Can you help me? I want a guy who's more realistic, more negative. And so it's one of the things, it's a huge counseling uh, responsibility on our end. But uh, anyway, uh, so this... So anyway, she, she gets this, you know, he gets this, uh, this, he gets served that he's being divorced. And so um, very soon after that, uh, Ted finds himself at this social event. And, uh, and, and so he's introduced to this very attractive woman, single woman, and uh, she happens to be close friends with the owner of his soccer club. Now she's a woman, uh, the owner is a woman, right? So they're close friends. And so they hit it off that night and they end up spending the night together, that very first night. So this doesn't even feel right in the plot line because he doesn't really feel like that kind of a player, right? But anyway, uh, they spend the first night together. And so, you know, I'm watching and it's like, oh, this is just, you know, go a little bit gratuitous here. Um, but anyway, what struck me was that uh, the next time he sees her is several weeks later. They've had no communication in between. Uh, the Caesar several times later just happens to bump into her. He comes into the owner's office one day, and this lady is there talking with her friend, right? And so he comes up, but here's what struck me. It wasn't awkward at all. They just greet each other. They, they won't, it's the second time they've met. They just greet each other, and they begin to openly talk about the quality of their sexual experience on that first night with the friend there. And I thought, isn't that a picture of our culture right now. Like those screenwriters are intentionally sending a message. Hey, sex is no big deal. All sex is good sex as long as consenting. Hey, and if you have sexual desires, the path of freedom is just to indulge them and that will lead you to freedom and fulfillment in life. So what I want you to catch is what we're doing, there's a clash of worldviews, isn't there? And what I want you to, this, this whole worldview over here is coming out of a naturalistic worldview that we often talk about. Kind of a naturalistic, put a little postmodern in there, a little new age in there. That's our culture, right? And so in a naturalistic worldview, we aren't created by a creator. There's no one to, res, to, to report to. We are not created to be like anyone. We're the, we're the result of billions of years of random accidents. And so we're really no different from the animals, uh, animals just a little higher involved. We don't get upset when hyenas mate. So why should we get upset when we as humans? 
It's a clash of worldviews. And what Paul says, and I want you to catch this, this is very important. What Paul says is this worldview is actually the result of the rejection of God. He says what happens is when you reject the truth about who God is, you lose the truth about who you are, and the lights go out. And you begin to think that what is foolish is actually wise. And so we live in the midst of a culture right now that truly believes that the path to human freedom and flourishing is unbridled sexuality of every kind. And you look at our culture and say, what is that producing? at every level, families, homelessness, kids without fathers, broken marriages, broken trust, STDs, rape, me too. It's like, this is what happens when you reject the truth, right? Okay, number three. Number three is that God's vision is recreation, okay? Not recreation, though that could be true too, but, but recreation. So let's talk about this. Uh, we're, we're looking here at the big picture story of our race. Paul says, here's what's happened. You reject the truth about God that's revealed in creation consciousness. He says, what happens is it sets off this downward death spiral. Right? It starts with spiritual confusion, uh, who God is, leads to sexual confusion, who we are, leads to social chaos. Here's what I want you to catch. When we come to Jesus, the whole point of coming to Jesus is to reverse that process. That when we come to Jesus, his vision for our life is so much bigger than we often think. And we've talked about this before. We come to Jesus so he can be forgiven of our sins and go to heaven when we die. It's not that it's not true. It's just it's very anemic. The vision is so much bigger. That Jesus came to restore all of creation and to restore us into who we were created to be. And the moment you came to Jesus, you entered into, we often call it a transformation, a a renewal process. I'm calling it here a recreation process. Now you see this throughout the New Testament, right? So so if if this process, if this process starts with spiritual confusion, leading to sexual confusion, leading to social chaos, then then how do we reverse that? When we come to Jesus, what are we doing? We start with spiritual clarity. We return to our understanding of who God actually is and who we actually are and the path to life. And as the lights begin to go on, we bow our knee to our creator and we no longer dishonor our creator and create our own gods. We turn from our idolatry. We return to the true creator through the Messiah Our minds are renewed, and then that needs to play out in our sexuality and then in our social relationships. Are you with me? Are you following this? It's super profound that Jesus came to reverse the downward spiral. So the New Testament talks about this often. I want to talk, I want to give you a couple examples. So the first one's in Colossians 3. In Colossians 3, uh, Paul has just said that. Because when we come to Jesus, we're united with him in his death and resurrection. And so we're, our life is now uh, the life in us. We've been born again. We have this new life, this Jesus life. And uh, when it comes back, when Jesus returns, our true identity for who we are will actually be revealed, you know, as the sons and daughters. So that's the context. And in this context, he says, therefore, because that's who you are, he says, so put to death whatever belongs to your earthly Nature, that old Romans one death cycle, nature. And he says, and and he's gonna give a a list of examples of what that human nature looks like and look where he starts. The first one is what? Sexual morality. In fact, the first three, sexual morality, impurity, and lust. So this is where he starts. And here's something, I don't know if you've noticed this, but whenever you read the New Testament, every sin list in the New Testament Everyone, you know, like Galatians 5, the works of the flesh, or 1 Corinthians 6, don't be deceived, those who do these things, or 1 Corinthians 5, anyone who claims a believer and do this, anyone, pick anyone throughout the New Testament, the first thing it says is always sexual immorality. Why? Because this is how our rebellion against God plays out. It, sex is such a strong drive 
that it begins to rule our lives when we begin to reject the truth about who God is. And so if we're, going to re- if we're going to return to our creator and be restored, that we have to return our bodies to him, Amen. to honor. And so he goes on, and he says, since you've taken off your old self, you know, who you were before you knew Jesus, with its practices, your old lifestyles, and you put on this new self, this new Jesus self, catch this, which is being renewed, underline that, in the Greek Like the English, it's present tense. The moment we come to Jesus, we enter into a transformation process that every day the Holy Spirit is helping us take the next step as we listen and follow, we're being renewed. I like the word here for today, recreated. We're becoming like our creator. And he says, notice how this recreation happens. He says, he put on the new self, which is being renewed in what? Knowledge. Knowledge. So what did we lose when we rebelled? We lost our knowledge. The lights went out. But when we come to Jesus, we give our life to Jesus, what happens? The lights start coming on. And this is why Paul will say later in Romans 12, be renewed, by, uh, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, the light starts going on, and as the light goes on, who God is, who we are, the path of life, we begin to step into that light, we are being renewed. And he said, well, what's the goal of this renewal? That we be renewed in the image of our Creator. See, that we would be recreated to be the people we were created to be. Now, one thing you're going to see as you go through the New Testament is that sexual returning to God in the area of our sexuality is a non-negotiable. If we're a follower of Jesus. Now, this doesn't mean that we can never fall and be forgiven. Of course we can, like any other sin. But that, that if we think that we can become a follower of Jesus and we can be saved without surrendering our bodies to God sexually, we are simply deceiving ourselves and catch this, we will not be part of the kingdom of God. And you say to me, that is strong words, and I agree. And so we're gonna read a passage now that says exactly that, because obviously it doesn't matter what I think, it matters what the word says, right? So let's look at a passage very similar to the Colossians 3. This is in Ephesians. Let's look up here on the screen. So it starts off chapter five where he says, follow God's example as dearly loved children and walk in the way of love. That's our calling, walk in the way of love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering. So Jesus is the model of what love looks like. He says, but among you, there must not even be a what? A hint of sexual morality. Are you hearing that? At the church of Rocky Peak, In our life groups, in our church, there should not be a hint of sexual immorality. We're not having sex outside marriage. We're not having extramarital sex. We're not having same sex. We're not having sex with kids. And we're not talking about it. Even our language, there's there's not double entendre. There's not sexual joking between it's with your wife, it's okay. <laughs> I'm just thinking, like, I'm just hanging myself up here. You know? Okay. Uh, yeah, I just, that's enough said, all right? Um, hey, but as followers of Jesus, not a hint. Not a hint. Not a hint. All right? And he says, of, or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's what? Holy. Holy people. Now catch this. There should not be any obscenity. Can I tell you something? We live in a day and age where there's many Christians who are just very proud of the foul language they use. I'm a Christian. I'm saved by Jesus. So I have the freedom in Christ. I can say F you. Uh, I can call you a piece of S, you know. I can, uh, I can, I can damn this, whatever, you know. And then there's almost a sense of like boasting about this, of how mature I am, that I realize that that doesn't matter. And they'll often say, well, the Bible doesn't say. Yes, it does. It says no obscenity, no foolish talk, no coarse sexual jesting. There, it's not appropriate for God's holy people. Like, we're called to be the light of the world. 
Okay, so he says, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. I, I love that. Remember in Romans 1, what did Paul say? That our, our initial sin, we rejected the truth of God. We didn't want to honor God as God or give thanks. And notice what happens when we come back and we're renewed. We become increasingly thankful. The more that we grow, the greater our gratitude. Because our eyes are opened, how small we are, how big he is, and everything we have is a gift. One of the signs of a growing follower of Jesus who's being transformed is their language is being shifted from the heart level. And they're growing in gratitude. And he says, now here comes his statement. This is what I was talking about earlier. For of this you can be what? Sure, underline it. He says that no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Well, I'm a Christian. I went forward at this thing. I prayed the prayer. Yeah, but you're living in sin. I don't think Jesus really cares. I think it's okay. Paul says, I don't know what you think about returning to your creator and becoming a Christian about, but it's not about that. We all sin. We all fall. It's one thing to fall and then come back and ask for forgiveness and truly repent. It's another thing to defend our sin and say, it doesn't matter. I'm going to live that way. Paul says, hey, if you think you're a Christian, you think you're part of the kingdom, you're not. You're deceiving yourself. In fact, this is something we hear in our culture increasingly today. The people who claim to be Christians living in one kind of sexual sin or another and saying, it's fine. And look what Paul says next. He says, let no one what? Deceive you. Rocky Peak. We live in the midst of a culture. Not only the culture is going crazy, the church is going crazy. You've got major churches in this country that we've looked to in the past for leadership that are embracing sexual immorality in the name of love. And Paul says, don't let anyone deceive you with empty words. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming on those who are disobedient. In the Greek, what it literally says is upon the sons of disobedience. What he means is non-believers. He says, if you act like a non-believer and you think you're a Christian, you, you need to think of, rethink this. He says, the wrath of God, and there, there are churches today, there's progressive Christianity today that will say, hey, we got, don't talk about the wrath of God. God is just love. This is not, we don't need wrath. We don't need the sacrifice. We don't need the atonement of God because of the wrath. Are you kidding me? Are you reading your New Testament? The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth. Paul says, hey, if you claim to be a follower of Jesus and you're living in high-handed sin, don't be, let anyone deceive you with empty words. On account of these things, the wrath of God is being revealed right here, right now on the sons of disobedience. So don't fool yourself. Don't let anyone deceive you. As you see this increase in our culture, people we've looked to as leadership, people we've looked to as orthodox voices are changing their story. But as for me and my house, I will stand with Jesus, I will stand with the word, I will stand with the apostles, right? We're not changing. We're not rewriting the Bible. We don't use a different dictionary. We don't say, well, in the Greek and in the Hebrew, you know. No, no, no. It's clear, right? Okay, you don't like the word wrath? Go with anger. I'm okay. All right. <laughs> All right, so, so three big picture principles, right? That sex is a God thing. It's a beautiful thing. It's designed to unite one man, one woman, a lifetime of loving and uh, commitment in which children can be raised and thrive and in healthy families, right? That's God's vision, right? So sex outside of that is destructive. What we're experiencing right now is a clash of worldviews. 
And uh, then number three, that uh, God's vision is not just our salvation, forgiveness, or it's a transformation our entire life, and that includes our bodies and our sexuality. So three questions I have here. Three principles, three questions. The gospel of God, three key questions. First of all, it's just such a critical question. This is just so basic. It's going to be a key question for the next three weeks. And it goes like this. Who sets your standards? We see today that we live in a culture that as always, has always been from the first century on, it's always at odds with the worldview of Jesus. The worldview of Jesus, the worldview of culture, it's always been different, it always will be different. And so the question is, who sets your standards? So as we go into these controversial areas that are often very personal for us, right? They, they involve our life, our sexual life, our sexual desires, right? Maybe loved ones, son, daughter, relatives, our workplace. Uh, there's, they have a lot of implications, but as we enter into this, this, uh, these, these next week, the question is, who sets your standards? And you basically have three options. You can set your standards. You can let culture set your standards, or you can let Jesus set your standards. And so just be honest about it. You say, well, I don't believe that. Okay, well, then what you're saying is you don't believe Jesus, the word, and the apostles. Yeah, that's right. I don't believe them. Okay, great. We can have a conversation about that. But don't call yourself a follower of Jesus and then kick it out and re or reorient, right, and then rewrite. It's like, just be honest about it. And so this is one of the core issues of all of our lives is that when it comes to these critical life decisions, who sets the standards? Me, culture, or Jesus? Right? Number two, second question, how's your heart? If you like the word mind better, that's fine. But, uh, but how's your heart? Uh, how's your mind? I think often we think of sexual integrity or sexual purity. The first thing we go to is our bodies. And for good reason, we'll come back to that in a minute. But what I want you to catch is that God's vision for our life in the area of sexuality is not just a transformation of our behavior, it's a transformation of our heart. And let me give you an example of that. When Jesus talked about this in Matthew 5, he said, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. So he's talking to a Jewish audience, they all know the word, this is the seventh of the Ten Commandments, one of the, the big top ten, you know that, hey, marriage is sacred, don't, don't break that. Uh, be sexual, lives lives of sexual integrity. And so then he goes on, he says, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully, and I describe this as I would if I could. All right? So what does it mean to look at a woman? It means that I look at her, and I'm going to look at her as long as I can without getting caught. Right? And in my mind, my mind is saying, I would if I could and not get caught. That, that's the idea. So he says, I tell you, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his what? Heart, right? So here, Jesus is always concerned with the heart level because for Jesus in the New Testament, transformation starts with the heart. Like we're not a behavior modification movement, Right? It doesn't to change your behavior. It starts with the heart. And so let's talk about what Jesus means and what he didn't mean. I've heard some Christians say, I'm sure it's well-meaning, but they're saying, hey, if you look at a woman like I would if I could, that's the same as committing adultery. And that's not what Jesus is saying. Committing adultery, this is the same sort of thing you hear. All sin is the same in God's eyes. It is not. All sin is a violation of the law. So in that sense, yeah, if you violate this, like, but all sin's not the same. Some sin is way more destructive. This is why in the Old Testament there are different penalties for different sin. Right? But Jesus is not saying that these are equal. You looked at that woman lustfully for 60 seconds, and that's the same as committing adultery. It's not the same. Adultery is amazingly more damaging than, than that, right? But what Jesus is saying is that his vision for our lives, because earlier he, he said, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, they're all about the outside. 
You won't be part of my kingdom. Jesus' vision is we're transformed from the inside out so that we'd be transformed to be like our... So here's the thing, that I don't want to commit adultery with her. His vision is that I would come to see life from his point of view. I could see life accurately. I could see that is so destructive. Committing adultery would be so destructive in so many ways and concluding to my own soul, why would I ever want to drink water from that mud hole? Right? So, so Jesus' vision is not just we do the right thing, that we're recreated to be like a creator. We see the truth about life. And this is what he's saying, that being righteous is much more than just not committing physical adultery. That being righteous is being transformed at a heart level to where we truly love other people and we would never want to objectify or use them in a destructive way. And so what are the implications? Well, there's so many implications. So men and women, like what are we doing with our minds and our hearts? Can I tell you something? Every time we look at porn, every time that we are strengthening the I would if I could heart. Every time we read a graphic romance novel, which I know all you guys are into. uh, (laughs) So I just see these guys, big books, you know, they're just, oh, you know. So um, every time we read a graphic romance novel and we begin to fantasize, we are strengthening our heart to be the kind of person that I would if I could. See, we all have this soul and it's all being shaped. We all have this inner person that's being shaped. And when we take in porn, we take in things we shouldn't see. We listen to music we shouldn't be listening to. We read We read these kinds of things and we're strengthening our heart but in the wrong direction. That we're becoming a little bit more a person who's addicted to our bodies. And we become a little bit more of I would if I could. And so the question is, how's our heart? There's a temptation to say, well, I'm good. I'm not doing anything with my body. Jesus' vision is so much bigger. It'd be transforming into the kind of person that actually loves people and would never lust after them or use them for your object. Did you love them as a brother or sister in Christ? Someone made in the image of God. Amen? Amen. Okay, number, number three. The, the third and last question is, how's your body? And of course, when we talk about sexual immorality, we're talking about our bodies. And it's interesting You know, you hear this today, even in Christian circles, that, like I said earlier, that, hey, what we do with our bodies is not so important in this area. And it's interesting, in the New Testament, Paul wrote his letter to the Corinthians, and because of their Greek philosophy background, there were many of them who were saying, hey, what God really cares about is our heart, you know, that we believe in Jesus, we're saved in our heart. What we do with our bodies doesn't matter, they're going to disintegrate. And Paul says, are you kidding me? He says, don't you realize that when you came to Jesus, Jesus bought your body. Your body doesn't belong to you. It's not your body and your choice. It's his body and his choice for both men and women. That our bodies belong. And you know what he does? When he buys our body, he remodels it and he turns it into a temple for himself to live in. And Paul says, don't you get it? Your body. And so when you have sex with a prostitute, you're like, you're like taking your body that's a temple of the Holy Spirit and you're connecting, it's like you're bringing Jesus into that sin. He says, listen, you need to, to honor God with your bodies. That's what it means to be a Christian. In fact, he goes on here, he says, he says uh, flee from sexual immorality, in other words, run for your life. He said, all other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins, sins against their own body. Just what he said in Romans 1. We're dishonoring our own bodies, our own selves. We're we're dehumanizing. Like every time we participate in porn, every time romantic novels, every time sexual immorality, we are dehumanizing ourselves. We are losing our humanity. 
And he says, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you receive from God? You're not your own. You're bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Don't dishonor your body. Honor God with your body. And so let me challenge those of you here, here online. Let me just challenge you and come back to this again is that this thing of sexual purity is a, it's a non-negotiable. And I'm sure that in a church like this, we have stories that you're, you've been dating someone, you're having sex with them. Maybe you've recently come to Christ and you're still having that old lifestyle, of kind of the one night stands. Or, or maybe you've been dating for a long time and you're justifying in your mind, well, someday we'll get married. Or maybe you're living together, we're planning to get married. Or maybe, maybe you're uh, living together, but you're engaged. So you say, well, that's good enough. Uh, maybe, and again, uh, a little on the wild side, but it happens, right? Maybe you are participating in threesomes. Maybe you're participating in wife swapping. Maybe you're living out a same-sex identity and engaging in sexual relationships. Uh, maybe it's something else, but, but here's the thing. That we need to understand that if we're going to follow Jesus, we can't do this. Remember what, what, what the writer of Hebrews said? Keep the marriage bed pure, for God will judge the adulterer and the sexually immoral. Remember what Paul said? Don't be deceived with empty words. On account of these these things comes the wrath of God upon the sons of disobedience. And And so now that we're clear on what sexual immorality is, then like how are we responding to this? How will we respond? And, you know, this is a challenge for us as a church, too, because you know what? The, the, the Jesus holds the church of Rocky Peak accountable for one another. We live in a very individualistic uh, society. We don't understand this. But do you remember how Jesus writes to the seven churches of Revelation in Revelation 2 and 3? He addresses them as a church. You've got this going on. You better get your act together. I'm taking you out. Right? And so he... He sees us as a church, right? So we're in life groups together. We're in mentoring relationships together. We're in friendships together. And when we allow sexual immorality to go on in the body and don't confront it, we are all participating in that sin. In Galatians chapter 6, Paul tells us how we are to approach this. He says, if any of you is caught in a sin, those who are spiritual, like led by the Spirit, we need to restore that person gently. We're not talking about Gestapo here. But if we're going to be the church of Jesus here at Church of Rocky Peak, we cannot wink at this. We are held accountable for this. And Paul says in chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians, he says that, if someone claims to be a believer in Jesus, now that's super clear. So some of you here, you're just checking out Jesus. You haven't come to Jesus. So if that's true, then I have no responsibility to hold you accountable for your sexual life. Like that's between you and God, right? But when you become a follower of Jesus and you say, I'm a follower of Jesus and you're part of this church, we are responsible for one another. And Paul says, if someone claims to be a follower of Jesus, but is living in high-handed, clear sin, and the first several examples are sexual immorality, then he throws in other things as well. He says that we have a choice to make. You can either hold on to your fellowship at the Church of Rocky Peak and hold on to the fellowship of your life group and leave your sin. Or you can hold on to your sin and you can leave Rocky Peak. You cannot have it both ways. Are you hearing me? We are the church of Rocky Peak. We are accountable to our king. We're accountable. And if we want to unleash a movement of passionate Christ followers, if we want to be a light on a hill, if we want to impact our culture, men and women, we have to shine brightly as lights in a dark world. 
And I'm telling you, there's nothing that will dim our light more than not honoring God with our bodies. Amen. And I want you to hear this. If this is you, it's probably a heavy message. And I just want to tell you, as one of your pastors, I love you. This is not about change or get out. Sometimes there's difficult situations. You're living together. I don't know how we're going to make, how make ends meet. We want to, you know, I can't tell you over the years how many couples that I've met with in a situation, why aren't you getting married? What's the story? We want to have a wedding. We want a big wedding. We just can't, can't afford it. And you don't want to tell couples, I'll say, you know what you need most in your new marriage if you want your marriage to thrive? And they'll say, what? And I'll say, you need the blessing of God. And you, right now, you're living in rebellion and wickedness. And you're hoping that God will one day bless you. Hey, I know you want to have a big party. Why don't you just get married now? I don't even do weddings. I'll do your wedding on the patio. Let's just, let's just get married. You can save up your money, and you can celebrate your marriage in six months, or a year, or two years, or 15 years. I don't care. But the most important thing is you honor Jesus as your king, right? And so there's situations, and we can work through all this, and we can have discussions, and we can come around and help and support. But what we cannot do is allow high-handed sin in the body of Christ and then expect Jesus to bless us. He will come to us like the churches of Revelation say, you've got these things right, but I have this thing against you. So clean up your act or I'm leaving town. Let's pray together. So as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, well, I bet we're all over the map here today. You know that for some of us, we've just been so strengthened by just the teaching of the word in the midst of a culture what's clashing worldviews, and we've just been strengthened by the Spirit. We've just felt the Holy Spirit affirming us and saying, yes, this is the right path, and you're not crazy, right? For others of us, there may be areas of our life, whether it's uh, what we do with our minds and hearts, what we do with our bodies, where we realize, hey, we're out of alignment. We've been rationalizing. We've been projecting. We've been defensive. We've been explaining away, and, and today the Holy Spirit is calling us home. And so during this time, we just want to have a time of repentance as we sing this song together. And Lord, I just pray that you'd come by the power of your spirit. And I pray, Lord, especially for those of us who are really in a place where we need to make a change, that you would do two things. You'd remind us how much you love us, but you'd also remind us that this is not an option. Like you said to the church of Laodicea, those I love, I rebuke. So I know that you think you're rich, you can see clearly, you have fine clothes, but the reality is you're poor, you're blind, you're naked. And so come to me and buy fine gold and I will give you eye salve for your eyes so you can see clearly and I will give you fine white garments. Behold, I stand at the door of my church and I knock and any man here, any woman here, that hears my voice and answers, I'll come in. And the beautiful thing about the gospel is Jesus always cares more where we're going than where we come. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what your sin is. There's a welcome for you in the kingdom of God. Jesus is always welcome, ready as the father of the prodigal to run to us when we turn, but not before we turn. We have to decide to come home. And so during this song, Lord, we just be all with all of us as you examine our hearts and bring us to a place of beautiful purity. We pray this in your name. Amen.